Hey everybody, um, I want to start out t with a few announcements. Um, you all should have <clears throat> received an email from T and Voice, um, and T and Voice is going to be the end of semester course evaluations where you can evaluate Biology 105 as well as me as your instructor. Um, I really want to kind of emphasize the importance of TN Voice um, because I will read the feedback. Um, my superiors read the feedback, so it does play a role in our evaluation and promotion. Um, and I personally use your all's feedback to make changes um, to the course as we go into future semesters. So please, please fill out the TN Voice. I know this has been a really weird semester, you know, I started out kind of, I felt a little, you know, oddly with, you know, my foot being broken and not being able to walk and then I had to transition to walking and then it seemed like just about the time that I was really, you know, getting my game back, so to speak, um, we had to transition to this online format. So I know it's not the usual semester, but please be honest in your feedback. I think they have adapted the um, surveys to kind of tell you to focus some of the questions on the, the, the period of the course before the transition. And then I think there are um, a couple of questions then specifically aimed at the transition to online um, instruction. So be honest in both areas. I really want to hear your feedback. Um, but also I want to tell you to be specific. Um, if you tell me something's good or bad, please tell me what exactly it is. You know, don't say, you know, I love this course. Of course you can say, I love this course. I love to hear that. But tell me what's good about it. Like what about my teaching? What about the course? What about the structure? What helped you learn? If something's bad, don't just say, you know, this class stinks, right? If it does stink, that's fine. But tell me what stinks. Like, um, you know, I hated, you know, not having as much homework, I thought we needed more homework, or maybe there was too much homework, or, you know, whatever. Um, just give me specifics so that I'll know things to focus on, okay? All right, so as I'm mentioning, this is really, really important to me. Um, and so to get you all to do this, I'm going to sort of dangle a carrot in front of you, um, if you will. Um, and I'm going to ask for 85% participation. That means that if 85% of you fill out the T invoice, here's the carrot, everyone gets three points added to the exam three score. All right, and I know some of you all are really trying to, you know, improve on exam three because remember, there is the chance for the highest exam to count twice and replace a lower scoring exam. So this will sort of help exam three kind of boost up there, if you will. Um, so, so yeah, I don't need screenshots, okay? I don't want proof of individual people filling this out. I have my own personal link that will take me to a page where I can see how many of you have done it. It won't show me who did it, but it'll show me like, okay, 100 out of 120 have filled out the survey. And then I can calculate the percent, right? And then I'll know, okay? I'll remind you maybe by email about this option. And I'll also sort of tell you like, oh, this is our percent participation at this point. Um, we need more. Keep going. So, um, so yeah, I'll start emailing about this. Um, we also, our last class is going to be on April 23rd. It says 2018. Good gracious that should say 2020. I don't know where that came from. The date is correct. The year, not. Um, oops. It's definitely 4, 23, 20 right there. All right. Um, that'll be our last class. I'm going to post sort of um, a PowerPoint, voiceover PowerPoint lecture video that's talking about sort of future and possibility of zombie apocalypse for that day. So it'll be a really light lecture day. The video won't be long. Um, but the disease paper will be due that day. Also, your extra credit option will be due on that day. The disease paper, you're going to submit that by going to the assignments link, looking for the disease paper, and uploading your file. Um, for the extra credit, you can go to the assignment link, but if you do, 
for the extra credit portion, it's going to take you to a discussion board. Or you can go straight to the discussion board because what I'm asking people to do is post their extra credit creative. That's what I'm calling it on the discussion board. Um, and we can have a whole lot of them posted up there. And then we're going to use the like function. So you can have up to five likes um, and you can like your own if you want to. Um, but then your other likes need to go to somebody else's videos um, or paper, poem, picture, drawing, creative, basically, because I opened this up pretty wild, uh, widely. Um, and then once we figure out from that discussion board, like what are the top five in each category, then I'll do an official vote probably by doodle poll. And I'll update you on the information and specifics of that. Um, lastly, I want to tell you about our final exam. It's going to be open for a longer period of time than I did for exam two. Um, I just want to make it more accessible to people. Um, our exam was scheduled for um, April 28th. And so I decided to kind of pick a range around that date. So the exam is still available to you on April 28th if that day was like in your calendar and that's what you want to stay with. You can still do that. Um, but I'm going to open it up a day earlier. So I'm going to open it up at 8 a.m. on the 27th. And I'm going to keep it open until 11.59 p.m., a minute before midnight on April 30th. Okay? So you're going to have a four-day window um, to take that exam. Now, you're going to need to log in well before midnight, okay? Because it will close at this time, all right? If you log in at 11, it's only going to give you 59 minutes then to take the exam. So you're going to need to to get your full time. Log in, you know, a few hours before midnight, please, um, <laughs> to, to get the full time. All right, so let's discuss infectious diseases of the digestive system. Um, that's the goal of this lecture video. Um, but first, I want to, because I, I did this in the usual class, um, I wanted to incorporate a couple of review clicker questions. Um, I know you can't click in and give me answers, but I'm going to show you the questions and then I'll show like past classes and sort of what they answered. Um, now, these review questions go back to the respiratory system. So it's not about the digestive system. Think back. All right, so the movement of mucus from the lungs to the pharynx is due to A, smooth muscle contraction ciliary escalator, sneezing and coughing, or pharyngeal reflux. Think about it. What is your answer? Write it down. Okay, what did they answer in the past? Ciliary escalator was pretty popular. Sneezing and coughing was second. And then pharyngeal reflux. All right, I failed to put a check mark by the correct answers here, but the correct answers are B and C. Remember that ciliary escalator? These, you know, the cilia, the cells that line um, the respiratory tract, they have cilia, and these cilia wave and beat in an upward motion. And we call this movement the ciliary escalator, because what happens is the mucus that's formed by these cells will be moved upwards and out by this escalator, the movement of the cilia. Also sneezing and coughing, that's going to sort of um, boost that action and move things, move that mucus up and out. Immunity from cold viruses eludes us because... Think about it. What's your answer? Okay. In the past, 92% of my last year's class anyway said all of the above, which is correct. I should have had a check by D, all of the above. Um, all viruses undergo antigenic drift. This is slow, gradual accumulation of mutations. Um, it allows them to slowly evolve and change over time, and this does apply to cold viruses, all right? And so and there's hundreds of different cold viruses, and they're all undergoing antigenic drift, slow changes. Um, cold viruses, in addition to that, they have their receptors down in these little pits or crevices, depressions, if you will, on the capsid. Um, 
And this makes it really hard for antibodies to be directed towards these receptors. So most of the vaccines that we have tried to make and when our bodies make antibodies, it's difficult, all right? The antibody production is relatively low. It's just not a good source to direct antibodies to. It doesn't work very well because they're down in these pits. The antibodies have a hard time binding and then blocking virus binding to host cells. All right, so what's going on with the digestive system? Um, the digestive system, again, I don't want you to become an expert. Like This is not supposed to be an anatomy class. However, I want to go over it just lightly with you all so that we can have enough information to talk about it. Um, the GI tract is going to be divided into two groups. You're going to have the actual GI tract itself, and this is the open pathway. It's open to the outside world, right? Our mouth down our throat, esophagus, stomach, intestines, all the way through to the anus, and that's the exit. That's the other opening, right? So it's a continuous opening through our body. Um, and then there are the accessory digestive organs, all right? These guys um, are protected by the peritoneum, so they're not actually in the GI tract, right? They are in the abdomen, and sort of on the outside of this opening. <laughs> um, these accessory organs are things, you know, like the gallbladder and the pancreas. Um, you're going to have teeth and tongues and things like that. Well, one tongue, hopefully. A te you're going to have many teeth and one tongue. Anyway, um, so these are, you've got those, the tooth and tongue, the teeth and tongue, if I can say that right, good gracious. They're involved in grinding food, right? And then digestive secretions, those are going to come more from like the gallbladder and pancreas that I mentioned. Um, all right. So the GI tract, let's look at it first. What does it do? Its job really is, it is the opening. It is where food is going to enter. And of course, it's going to be where, you know, so nutrients and water and things will enter and then they can be absorbed as they move along the way down the path. By the time we get to the end of the path, there's really nothing more than waste left to us. I mean, I guess there's still quite a bit of nutrition in that waste, but we have then, as, it's, as the food and, and nutrients and water have moved through the tract, we've absorbed most of what we can, and then by the time it gets to the end, it's considered waste, and that's where we eliminate the waste out the anus. Um, and so, yes, it starts with the mouth. This is where all the food and nutrients and water and things are going to enter. And we're going to start digestion there, right? You're gonna, that's the mouth. It's, it's got the teeth. Um, you've got salivary glands that are going to be secreting enzymes and saliva and things. And you're going to be grinding up the food. You're going to swallow it. It's going to go down into the esophagus, which is a long, thin tube that kind of leads into the stomach. The stomach's really, really acidic, right? And it's going to then... Um, help in um, chemical kind of digestion. There's lots of enzymes there. The stomach also does mechanical churning. There's, it's, it's a muscular type organ, so it's going to be involved in further breakdown of the food with mechanical type breakdown. Um, and then it's going to move things into the small intestine. So the mouth, esophagus, and stomach, stomach excuse me, is mostly where the breakdown occurs. Um, in the small intestine, there's going to be some more digestion. But this is mostly where absorption occurs, right? This is where the absorption part begins. Um, and the large intestine continues absorption mostly of water. Most of the nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine. Um, the large intestine finishes some nutrients there probably, but mostly um, finishes up the moisture absorption. And then by the time it gets to the rectum and anus, it's ready for, for elimination. All right, so here's an image of that showing you, and this guy's about to eat a sandwich, I guess, right? Here's his mouth, and you've got the, to the teeth and tongues and salivary glands secreting saliva with the enzymes, and then we move it down through the pharynx into the esophagus, which is that long muscular tube, that smooth muscle contraction that kind of forces food down into, oops, I went to the liver, down into the stomach, <laughs> right? And the stomach's going to have um, digestive acids and juices secreted, 
Um, and then food's going to move into the small intestine here where the gallbladder and pancreas are going to secrete digestive juices as well. And then the food is going to be moving through the small intestine and the absorption's going to occur before it finally moves through the large intestine, which kind of wraps up and around. I kind of went the wrong way. It should go this way. Down to the anus for elimination. Definitely don't worry about ascending colon and descending colon and sigmoid colon and transverse colon. Don't worry about the duodenum, the jejunum, and ileum. Um, the duodenum is talking about kind of the upper small intestine. The jejunum is the middle part, and the ileum is kind of the lower part. Um, but anyway, um, we're not going to worry about that. I won't quiz you on that, all right? All right, so... Let's give a little bit more information about this, just to make sure I have said this thoroughly. Um, I want to tell you, um, when we eat, we're going to chew and moisten the food in the mouth before we swallow it. Um, digestion does begin here with salivary enzymes. Muscle contractions called peristalsis, that's the smooth muscle contractions, will move the moistened food down the esophagus which is the muscular tube at the back of the throat. It's gonna move it down into the stomach. The stomach secretes hydrochloric acid and a protein enzyme called pepsin, and that pepsin will break down proteins. These chemicals, the acids and the pepsin, will further the chemical digestion of food as it is held in the stomach. The stomach will also mechanically digest as it churns and moves the food around inside the stomach then the food will slowly and gradually be emptied, partially digested already, into the small intestine. The small intestine then is named so because it's really only three centimeters in diameter. However, it is about six meters long, so it's really long. It's divided into three parts, like I said, um, and this is where the majority of digestion and absorption of nutrients occurs. I don't know if I said that um, because I kind of made it sound like the most of the, the digestion was happening in the stomach. You should really think of the mouth and stomach as the start of digestion, and then most of digestion and absorption happening in the small intestine. All right, this is because as food moves into the small intestine, you're going to have more enzymes, um, more enzymes and digestive juices. Enzymes coming from the pancreas and gallbladder are going to be secreted into the small intestine as the food from the stomach is emptying in, all right? And this will further help digest that food. And then the small intestine is really awesome for absorption. Um, I'm going to show you some images later because the small intestine has all these little folds all over the surface. All right, the small intestine is going to have these little folds, millions of finger-like projections called villi. Each of them are lined with cells that have microvilli, even more projections. So it's really cool. I think about it like a bunch of little fingers sticking up, and then the fingers having fingers, okay? Amazing. It gives a huge amount of surface area, absorptive surface area, they estimate it to be about 2 million centimeters squared, about 2,150 square feet, the size of an average two-story American house. That is the amount of surface area estimated to be in your intestines, in your small intestines, due to these um, villi and microvilli. All right, and then you're going to have intestinal peristalsis, smooth muscle contraction of the intestines will move the undigestion and unabsorbed material finally into the large intestine, also known as the colon. The colon will complete absorption of nutrients and water. And then the remaining undigested material called feces is going to be mostly con you know, con composed of fiber and bacteria at this point. They're going to pass into the rectum, which will then store them until they're going to be eliminated through the anus, which is a process called defecation. All right. Now, the esophagus, the stomach, and the duodenum, these regions are mostly free of, the, the duodenum is the upper small intestine. These regions are mostly free of microbes. Um, you're going to have constant movement from that peristalsis. And so you're going to have movement of food, 
um, and movement of the contents and that really does help prevent accumulation of food particles and organisms in those areas all right and then of course think about the stomach acid the stomach acid has a pH of about two this is like battery acid this will destroy most organisms um, it's antimicrobial to say the least um, and then of course food doesn't sit in the stomach very long either it's rapidly transported to you know the um, the small intestine all right now microbes do colonize the mouth all right so if we think about the tongue and teeth um, microbes do also colonize the small intestine and the large intestine or the colon um, so upper to the stomach and then lower to the stomach those areas are really colonized heavily okay in the mouth you're going to have a number of streptococcus species streptococcus viridans I wrote that backwards. It should say Streptococcus viridans. This is meaning viridans species of Streptococcus are most prevalent. But I could have said Streptococcus viridans is most prevalent in this region. Um, it is most common in the mouth. Um, it has these adhesins, all right, that will allow it to adhere to the tongue, the inside of the cheek, the pharynx, so your throat region, um, and the teeth, all right. And then you also have, so there's other streptococcus there as well. You've got streptococcus mutans. Streptococcus mutans um, does not like to attach to the tongue, cheek, pharynx, but it specifically likes to attach to your teeth. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to show you later, you can have anaerobic regions, pockets in the gums, that will be um, colonized by this guy, pyro Phyromonas gingivalis, and this is the guy that causes um, gingivitis. So we'll see that later as well. So you've got a lot of Streptococcus and some others. There's actually about 700 species um, in the mouth, and they can be, you know, part of oral biofilms, the plaque and the tartar that you find on your teeth and gums. Um, so it's not just the Streptococcus or the Phyromonas gingivalis, but Streptococcus is going to be the most prevalent in that biofilm. Um, they say that each milliliter of your saliva contains millions of bacteria. Millions. Um, now, <laughs> that sounds like a lot, but this is worse. All right, the, <laughs> the small intestine um, and the colon are home to an, action, uh, an estimated 100 trillion bacteria. That is 10 to the 14th power bacteria um, and over 10 to the 11th bacteria are present in every gram of feces they actually account for 40 percent of your fecal mass so they are growing and multiplying to very very high numbers as food passes through your intestines and large you know your intestines large and small and then a lot of them are passing out in that fecal material the various types that we find here um, tend to be Bacteroides species, Lactobacillus species, E. coli, Escherichia species, Enterobacter, Proteus. We also find Candida, which is a yeast, um, and Entamoeba, which are amoebas. That is also a protist. All right. So Candida was a yeast, which was a fungus. Entamoeba was the, the amoeba, and that's a protist. All right, so let's think about some, those are the normal flora and things that we find there. Some of them are opportunistic pathogens um, and can cause disease. Um, other infections of the digestive system are not part of the normal flora and would not be considered opportunistic pathogens. Um, an example of that um, would be this bacterial gastroenteritis. Some of them can be caused by uh, normal flora, but the first example I'm going to go over with you will be cholera. Um, now, gastroenteritis as a whole um, can be caused by a number of different species. Um, it's really defined as an inflammation of the stomach or intestines caused by the presence of bacteria or viruses. 
All right, if we're saying bacterial gastroenteritis, though, we're meaning bacterial gastroenter bacteria. You could say viral gastroenteritis, and it would be caused by viruses then. Um, and there's a number of viruses that cause viral gastroenteritis, just like there's a number of bacteria that cause bacterial gastroenteritis. Um, gastroenteritis does occur worldwide. Um, it occurs generally in one in every 1,000 people, but it is most often going to be found in developing or underdeveloped countries. It's associated with poorly prepared foods, contaminated washing or drinking water, and communities with poor living conditions. Um, institutional settings can be prone to outbreaks in developed countries, and you've probably heard of... Um, viral gastroenteritis, especially being um, in the news lately um, with um, cruise ships. There's been outbreaks of noroviruses like stomach um, causing diarrhea and vomiting going around the cruise ship. So in developed countries, there are risks um, if you're hospitalized or institutionalized or in an enclosed area like a cruise ship. Um, manifestations of gastroenteritis, general features of it, um, are pretty similar despite the fact that you've got a number of viruses and a number of bacteria that can cause it. You're usually going to see things, um, if you do see symptoms, because some people are asymptomatic and pretty mild, um, but if you do see symptoms, it's usually things like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of appetite, abdominal pain, cramps. Um, some people will also experience malaise and fever, um, just a general feeling of not feeling well. And fever is going to lead to, of course, chills and um, sweating and, you know, muscle aches and pain. Um, in rare cases, you can have these types of infections that leave the GI tract. Most of the time, they're going to be self-limiting and they're going to stay in the GI tract. Um, but I'm going to show you a couple of examples, like salmonella, for example, that can actually leave the GI tract and affect other organs. Um, treatment is generally going to involve replacement of fluids and electrolytes. So we're going to treat the symptoms because um, we have a lot of fluids and electrolytes lost during diarrhea and vomiting um, and this can cause dehydration and death if it's not replaced. Um, most often that fluid replacement can be by drinking water like self-administration of fluids like you just drink water or over-the-counter electrolyte solutions like sports drinks or Pedialyte. Um, but in some cases where it's, you know, severe, you might need IV fluids um, to replace them in a more quick, you know, mass manner. There are also antidiarrheal drugs that sometimes people take, um, but usually those are not actually recommended because um, it can actually prolong your symptoms um, because that diarrhea flushes the organisms causing the illness out. Um, and if you stop that diarrhea, then what you do is you actually allow the organisms to remain in your intestines for longer. Not good. All right, so what's an example um, of a type of bacterial gastroenteritis? Um, one of them is cholera. And I really want to highlight cholera um, as our disease for this um, body system. We've been sort of highlighting a disease as we go along each of the categories. Cholera will be our disease of highlight this time. So we will watch a video on cholera. Um, it's going to be posted to Canvas. You're going to answer a question set um, and you're going to turn that question set in. It's going to be due on Tuesday of next week, I believe, 421 the cholera video and question set. Um, so that will be the content for the class for 421. All right, so what is cholera? Um, cholera is a type of bacterial gastroenteritis. Um, it's actually pretty important. We haven't heard about it much recently, but there have been seven, at least seven pandemics of cholera since 1817. Um, and scientists, there is, scientists say there is a current epidemic in India um, that they say could become an eighth pandemic if it is not kept under control. All right, so cholera is caused by this bacteria. It is a gram-negative rod. 
So it's a gram-negative bacillus. Um, Vibrio cholerae. This genus Vibrio is composed of species that um, occur usually in a natural, like saltwater environment. Um, so marine environments worldwide, seawater. Um, they prefer warm, salty, even kind of alkaline. So the pH should be a little bit alkaline. That's their preferences. Um, however, Vibrio cholera is different. So most species of Vibrio like saltwater. Vibrio cholera, on the other hand, can actually survive in both fresh and salt water. That's the problem. All right, so Vibrio cholera can get into fresh water, and then if humans ingest that bacteria, then it enters in, it can survive through the stomach, it can go down into the intestines and cause a major problem. Um, so yeah, it's the only species that can survive in both salt and fresh water. In salt water, it usually survives by forming biofilms, um, which are not infective. But when it gets in fresh water, the biofilms fall apart and the bacteria prefers the single mode of life. So the, bi the biofilm sort of breaks up and they, the single Vibrio cells become modal. They, they grow flagella and they start swimming around and they become infective. All right. Um, the single most important virulent factor is production of what we call a cholera toxin. This toxin um, is coded for by a plasmid. So the Vibrio cholera has to have the plasmid in order to be infective. All right, this toxin, let's look at it. It looks crazy if we look at this figure, but I'm gonna explain it in a pretty simple way and I expect you all to understand it at a very simple level, okay? Um, the cholera toxin is what we call an AB toxin. Um, AB toxins have two components. The A portion is the actual toxin part. Um, the B part is merely a receptor that is involved in getting A into the cell. All right. Um, what you're looking at here across the bottom it says intestinal lumen. This just means we are looking at the insides of the intestine, the small intestine here. And these are the cells, it says epithelial cells. They are the cells that line the wall of the intestines. They have the finger-like projections that I told you about. These are the villi. And then we're not seeing them, but you gotta imagine on the surface of each finger-like projection, there are more fingers called microvilli. So this finger is actually coated in more fingers. Anyway, you get all these fingers, <laughs> if you will, and it creates the 2,000 blah, blah, blah square foot house of absorptive surface area. So all of this, this the nutrients are absorbed across this surface area. All right. Now, what we're seeing is the toxin coming into the picture. So this Vibrio has been ingested and the bacteria is in the intestinal lumen. So we're inside the intestines and the Vibrio is secreting this AB toxin. This is an exotoxin. B will act as a receptor and will bind to the surface of these epithelial cells. So it will bind to the microvilli or the villi, whatever. And what happens upon binding is A gets into the cell. Now that A is inside the cell, A acts as an enterotoxin. Remember, we, we learned about three types of exotoxins. We said one of them was an enterotoxin. That was a certain class of exotoxin. A is an enterotoxin. And so what that does is it causes diarrhea. How it causes diarrhea? A will actually interfere with the metabolism of the cell. That's what this is showing. All right, I don't, you know, if you, if you know more about metabolism, that's great because A is an enzyme that will activate adenylate cyclase. That's what they're showing here. That's what AC is. AC will encourage ATP to be cleaved. 
and form cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP then will stimulate the cell to release sodium chloride and other electrolytes out into the intestinal lumen. This will then cause water to follow by osmosis. So water will just diffuse out because water goes to the area of, water goes with the solutes. That's what these electrolytes are when they're spit out. It's going to increase the solute concentration here and water's going to go with it and then that's the diarrhea. All right. Now, this diarrhea is problematic because it causes dehydration um, and can lead to low blood pressure and shock. Okay, um, as well as the electrolyte loss also is problematic, leading to several things that can happen to you. Okay, um, but also the diarrhea does flush bacteria out, so it promotes the bacteria getting flushed out, which is good for the host because the back they need the bacteria out, but it's also bad for future hosts because when the bacteria gets flushed out, well, now the bacteria are flushed out, and if someone else comes into contact with those feces and those bacteria, and then it gets on their hands or they ingest it somehow, this fecal oral transmission route, right? So the diarrhea is harming the host, um, <laughs> can cause diarrhea, but also helping flush it out of the host. So it's like a double-edged sword there. Um, and also involved in transmission. Wow. Okay. So what are you going to do? Um, this severe fluid and electrolyte loss results in dehydration. Like I said, thirst, it can also result in metabolic acidosis decreased pH of bodily fluids, and like I said, cause shock by reduced blood volume in the body. You can end up with muscle cramps, lethargy, sunken eyes, irregular heartbeat, kidney failure, coma, and of course death. So what are we going to do? How do we diagnose cholera? It is diagnosed based on a really unique um, sign and symptom called rice water stool. This is watery, colorless, odorless diarrhea that has flecks of mucus. The flecks of mucus look like little bits of rice. All right, and that's why they call it rice water stool. Um, and so if rice water stool is noted, we will treat with supportive care and administration of tetracycline. Tetracycline is an antibiotic. You don't need to memorize the name. You just need to know we're going to give antibiotics because bacteria can be treated with antibiotics. Um, there is an available vaccine. It's against only one strain of cholera, um, but immunity is really short-lived, so it doesn't last very long at all. So it's not a good preventative, really, um, and there's no vaccine for the other strains. And so because of that fact, people generally really aren't vaccinated. Um, the best mode of prevention is going to be good sanitation and proper hygiene. All right. For this, to highlight this disease further, I really want you all to go to Canvas, to the videos and question sets on the homepage, find the cholera video called The Big Stink. Um, watch that. You probably need to watch it to about minute 40, I would say. Um, it's about a cholera outbreak in London. It talks about the sewage systems of early London. It's really interesting. It, it talks about how they disposed of waste, and it, it's really cool. There's, there's a lot of really interesting information. It also talks about one of the first epidemiologists, this guy, Jon Snow, um, who really traced the origin of the outbreak to um, this water pump. Um, it's pretty interesting. And then it talks about one of these engineers that this guy, Bazaljet, who is hired to kind of solve the problem. Um, and he has to reroute um, the sewage system into the Thames at a place lower <laughs> than their water intake. So it's really interesting. Um, so watch this video, answer the questions in the question set, and then submit them to Canvas. This will be due on April 21st, so next Tuesday by 5 p.m., I believe. All right. So what are some other types of bacterial gastroenteritis? Because I mentioned there's a lot, and you've probably heard of virulent E. coli. Um, and you've heard of people getting um, some severe outbreaks and diarrhea from E. coli. Um, you've probably heard of this specific one. It's a specific E. coli strain called 0157H7. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. 
Um, anyway, this is a strain of E. coli. It is named based on these O and H antigens on the surface of the E. coli. So these are certain, you know, surface proteins that are known to be associated with virulence if it has this 157 type of O and 7 type of H. Anyway, this strain of E. coli is considered virulent um, because it has virulence genes that are on a plasmid. Um, what we see on this plasmid are the following genes. Um, there are genes that code for adhesins, genes that code for fimbri, and genes that code for some pretty severe toxins. Um, the toxins and the fimbri and the adhesins together allow these strains to colonize um, the, the, the intestines, attach, and cause disease. And I'm going to show you... Um, some really cool structures <laughs> produced by some of these bacteria. So I'm going to show you that E. coli, the O157H7, and then we're going to talk about Salmonella too later. They can both produce this needle-like structure um, that's called a type 3 secretion system. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, so let's take a look um, at what's going on here. Um, the enterotoxins, there, there is an enterotoxin. I sh shouldn't say toxins. There's probably um, one. It is a Shiga-like toxin. They call it Shiga-like toxin because it is a toxin very similar to one produced by a bacteria called Shigella. I'm not going to cover Shigella, but Shigella can also cause severe bacterial gastroenteritis enteritis, blah. And the Shiga toxin is what it produces. E. coli produces a Shiga-like toxin. Okay. Anyway, it is an enterotoxin and a cytotoxin. So it disrupts electrolyte balance as an enterotoxin and it causes diarrhea. As a cytotoxin, it will cause host cells like the epithelial cells in the intestines it prevents them from, from making like proteins, and so it causes them to just die outright. Um, so it directly kills cells and causes diarrhea, this Shiga-like toxin. So you would probably want to say diarrhea and cell death mediated by a Shiga-like toxin, which is an enterotoxin and cytotoxin. There are notes, if you go to the PowerPoint for this, there are notes typed below each slide and it describes everything that I'm saying. Um, there's also this type 3 secretion system. Let me show you this. The type 3 secretion system is responsible for delivering the Shiga-like toxin, which causes the diarrhea as the enterotoxin and acts as cytotoxin and kills the cells outright it delivers it. It is a delivery system. So you might think of this effector here. One, there's many effectors that's going to travel through this tube into the host cell. But you could think of one of them as the Shiga-like toxin. I'm going to show you another one in the next slide, but let's think about this first. All right, so this is the structure this is the type 3 secretion system that we see on the bacteria. Here is the surface of the E. coli O157H7. That's this, the virulent strain that produces this needle structure. It has a few rings. It kind of looks like a flagella. If you remember back to when we talked about flagella, right? This is a gram-negative bacteria, so there's rings that anchor it into the inner membrane. Then there are rings that anchor it into the outer membrane. There's peptidoglycan in the middle there. They're not really showing that, but it's in there. And then there is this long extension. It's not as long as flagella, and it's definitely not flexible and whip-like, and it doesn't rotate like a flagella. Instead, this is a needle, and it's rigid, and it's hollow. It's like a hypodermic needle. And what this bacteria is going to do is it's going to find a host cell and it's going to stick this needle in to the membrane of the host cell. And it's going to deliver first these 
orange proteins. So these orange proteins called translocators will travel through the tube and insert themselves in a ring into the host cell. They're saying eukaryotic cell cytosol because that's the eukaryote. This would be your intestinal cell, okay? This could be one of the villi, all right? And now these orange proteins insert themselves into the membrane and they make like a donut, uh, donut, shape, donut shape. They make a pore or a hole. Now the needle can enter into the hole, insert through the hole, and now the toxins will go through. The effectors, they're calling them effectors. These are the exotoxins. These toxins will now be produced, secreted, shuttled through the needle and into the host cell. Oh my God. In the host cell, this will cause diarrhea. This will cause the host cell to not be able to make proteins and will act as a cytotoxin and kill them. So it's gonna be an enterotoxin and a cytotoxin causing electrolyte, loss, protein synthesis to stop, and cells to die. Now, in addition to this, this needle, not shown here, also takes the, the E. coli. So our intestinal cells really don't have a good receptor for E. coli to bind to. And so one of the effectors that crosses through will act as a receptor. Let me show you. All right, this slide shows the E. coli cell here. This is the lining of our intestines. This could be one of the, this is the surface. All right, E. coli has made its way towards the surface. Here is the needle. E. coli has already inserted the translocator, the orange proteins to make the pore. Okay, they're not showing that. But we do see the needle is inserted into the host cell, and you see that proteins are going in. They're calling them effector molecules. You see more than one here. The previous slide showed one effector. There's more than one. There's an orange one, a blue one, and a green one. All right? One of these is definitely the Shiga-like toxin, and it's going to cause the diarrhea and the cell death. Another one of these is a receptor, this green molecule. The E. coli shoots it in. This molecule is a protein that will then rise to the surface of the host cell, insert itself there, and now E. coli can bind to it. So E. coli inserts its own receptor into the intestinal cell, and then E. coli binds tightly to it. And that's where the adhesin comes into play. So E. coli has an adhesin called intamin that will bind to this green guy called tear. Tear is the receptor and E. coli made it and pushed it into the cell and forced, forced it onto the surface of the host cell and now E. coli binds to it. All right, in addition to that, something that's really poorly understood but also amazingly cool, one of these effectors will change the shape of the intestinal cell. So what you see here is this thing called actin. This is the cytoskeleton of your cell. These are protein filaments that are responsible for the shape of your cell. You saw back here that the surface had villi and microvilli, all right? But when E. coli binds to it, E. coli is tiny. So really the surface to E. coli appears flat in a region. Yes, it is a region on the fingers, but there are flat regions, especially if you're tiny and you have that perspective, okay? So E. coli really is docking to a flat area. It shoots in its receptor, shoots in its effector, and then the cell protrudes upwards. Whoops, I pushed the button. Pushes it upwards. So it was flat at the start, and the type three secretion injected, and these effectors cause this shape to change and form what we call a pedestal, all right? It is like an area that rises up above the rest 
of the surface of the intestine and it projects outward. This is a scanning electron micrograph of these pedestals. All right, and you see the E. coli sitting on top of his pedestal. We don't really know the formate, you know, the exact function of the pedestal, but we do know that if pedestal formation is inhibited, these E. coli are much, much, much less um, toxic. All right. So they show a marked reduction in virulence. They show a marked reduction in their ability to bind to the T receptor. So we hypothesize that the pedestal pushes the E. coli up and out of the range of competition. If you've got a whole host of bacteria already colonizing the surface of the intestines, and we do, we've got tons of bacteria there, millions, trillions, remember? I said 10 to the 14th, it's crazy. This E. coli has got a way to kind of push part of the intestines up and out of that range of competition <laughs> um, and allowing it to bind more tightly um, to the intestines. It's, it's really sort of the hypothesis we have right now. All right. Other types of... Oh, I should tell you, I didn't tell you, how you commonly um, acquire E. coli. This could be from, this is the oral fecal route because E. coli is in feces. And so if it's generally from like contaminated fruits and vegetables, if people, you know, if sewage contamination occurs um, or poorly cooked and butchered handled meat products can contain E. coli. They find that about 50% um, of beef carcasses in the U.S. Um, have this O157H7. Um, um, but despite its prevalence, only about 1 in 10 million deaths in the U.S. is attributed to E. coli in ground beef. So it's, it's because if you cook it properly, it's not a problem. Um, but this could also be um, a problem in sewage contaminated water. If there were storms or, you know, infrastructure breakdown or things like that occurred. Um, all right, another type is salmonella. Um, I introduced you a little bit to this earlier on when we talked about um, um, typhoid fever with typhoid Mary, right? Um, because salmonella can also cause some serious bacterial gastroenteritis. Um, with salmonella, there's going to be two diseases or two conditions that are generally um, sort of categorized. And there are hundreds, excuse me, 2,000, <laughs> whoops, two th more than 2,000 unique serotypes or strains of salmonella <laughs> that can cause salmonellosis and typhoid fever. So, interestingly, um, there's, there's quite a few types. Um, commonly, though, Salmonella enterica strains are what is responsible, um, and it's usually typhi and paratyphi that cause typhoid fever, and salmonella um, enterica enteritidis or salmonella enterica typhimerian that causes salmonellosis. There are, like I said, more than 2,000 different serotypes, but these are the most two common serotypes that cause typhoid fever, these are the most two common serotypes of the salmonella enterica that cause salmonellosis. All right, how does it work? This is a gram-negative bacteria. It lives in the intestines of a number of vertebrates. Not usually humans, though, okay? It's usually found especially in reptiles, um, and it's eliminated in their feces, but many other vertebrates as well. Um, reptiles like chickens, you know, because we've heard of salmonella being associated with chicken eggs. Um, if ingested, the virulent strains of salmonella, they can tolerate the acidic condition of the stomach. In the E. coli we talked about before, 
in the cholera, they can also tolerate the acidic environment of the stomach and they pass into the intestines um, and then they're going to attach by specific adhesins. Salmonella will be very similar to the E. coli situation because salmonella will produce a type 3 secretion system. So it has the little needle-like structures and then it's going to introduce a variety of toxins into the host cell. Um, these toxins will act as enterotoxins, so they will disrupt metabolism like the cholera toxin did and cause diarrhea. These toxins will also um, inhibit phagocytosis though in the case of salmonella. Um, it does uh, cause rearrangement of the cytoskeleton like we saw in E. coli and we see pedestal formation as well. Um, Humans will generally acquire typhoid fever by consumption of food or water um, contaminated with feces from a carrier. That is a common method. Um, the carrier can be healthy and remain asymptomatic. Remember, typhoid Mary carried Salmonella typhi, Salmonella enterica, strain typhi in her intestines and she was completely healthy um, but she was passing out salmonella you know bacteria in her feces and then getting those on her hands and then passing that to food and then people were ingesting it <coughs> um, about one-third of chicken eggs also carry salmonella even those laid by asymptomatic chickens so you can have <laughs> carrier chickens um, the bacteria in the feces can cover their eggs when they're laid. Um, additionally, some eggs can actually harbor salmonella internally if they are produced by chickens with infected ovaries. So it's really recommended that you don't eat raw eggs. Um, an infective dose is going to need quite a few bacteria. You're gonna need about 1,000 to 10,000 cells. Um, and those cells will, like I said, pass through the stomach and once they reach the intestine, um, they will then be engulfed by um, phagocytic cells. So we're going to see phagocytosis play a role here. I'll show you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there's going to be a toxin produced that inhibits complete phagocytosis, so the phagocytic cells don't digest the salmonella and can then instead take them to the liver, spleen, bone marrow, and gallbladder. In that case, this is generally considered salmonellosis because it is leaving the intestines. Um, this would cause fever, headache, muscle spasms, malaise, loss of appetite that might persist for a week or more. Um, you can actually have, <coughs> excuse me, 12 to 30% of patients can die without treatment. So it can be quite severe. All right, here's an image. Um, salmonella, in the case of salmonella typhoid fever, it generally will just attach to the intestinal cells. Um, <coughs> goodness. Gosh, I hope I'm not getting sick. <laughs> By its type 3 secretion system, it will inject a receptor. It will cause pedestal formation. It will inject other toxins, causing diarrhea, cell death. Um and it can stay there and cause a severe diarrhea. However, in other cases, it can become more invasive. It can be taken in by phagocytosis. Incomplete though. Once inside the cell, the bacterium aren't digested, okay? And they actually multiply inside that vesicle. This is incomplete phagocytosis due to a toxin that prevents digestion. Once there, they can actually kill the cell with their cytotoxins um, and then reach lower invade bloodstreams, reaching, you know, the tissues and the capillaries and the blood vessels and veins, you know, in the underlying deeper tissues. They can then travel to um, other organs. Um, and this is much, much more severe. Diagnosis and treatment, um, they're going to look for salmonella in the stool. It's usually self-limiting. 
Although in some cases, people can have recurring typhoid fever. Salmonellosis is, is usually self-limiting too. It doesn't usually invade to other organs. Typhoid fever can usually be self-limiting as well. However, if they aren't self-limiting and if they remain, because typhoid fever can actually, the, the bacteria can get into your gallbladder and you can have what's called recurrent typhoid fever where bacteria are released periodically from the gallbladder. <laughs> and salmonellosis, like we said, it can get further than the intestines. It can actually, you know, get deeper into the bloodstream and invade other organs. So if they are not self-limiting, you can um, use antibiotics. All right. Antibiotics will kill salmonella at the current time. Prevention is going to be washing the hands and proper hygiene in the kitchen, especially. Um, also avoiding, um, you know, eating undercooked eggs. And if you have reptiles as pets, you want to be careful around them because they are commonly shedding and they'll have these, you know, salmonella all over them. And so if you handle them, you want to wash your hands after it and avoid putting your hands in your mouth. Um, remember the Typhoid Mary video that's posted to Canvas. Uh, remember, this was on exam two, so I won't ask you about it again, but I just want to remind you that Typhoid Mary was a healthy carrier of salmonella typhi. All right. Let's think forward with a question. And let's move to a new area. This is about tooth decay. So diets high in sugars and starches increase the risk of tooth decay or cavities because they Think about it. What's your answer? All right, this is what past classes said. The sugars and starches that you ingest will be converted to acids by bacteria. And then the acid destroys the tooth enamel. The sugar is not already acidic enough to destroy tooth enamel. Now, you might have heard that diets high in citrus because they can be acidic and destroy tooth enamel. This is not sugar and starches. Sugar and starches generally are not um, going to be acidic yet. But once you ingest them and they're in the mouth, the bacteria will ferment them to an acid, and then the acid then destroys the tooth enamel. <coughs> All right. Signs and symptoms. Dental caries, gentivitis, and periodontal disease. These are diseases of the mouth. And actually, dental caries are really, really common. These are cavities. It's a fancy way to say cavities. And they are common, or they are second, excuse me, to common colds in frequency. So they're really, really prevalent. They occur in people of all age groups. Um, they usually um, form at a more higher rate, though, during childhood. Um, gingivitis, on the other hand, is not cavities. This is inflammation of the gums. Um, and it is a form of periodontal disease, um, which periodontal disease really just means an inflammation and infection of the tissues surrounding and supporting the teeth. So inflammation or infection of the gums. All right, so caries, the cavities, they will usually appear as holes or pits in the teeth. Um, kind of darker in color usually, um, and it's noticeable only uh, um, most of the time in the later stages of the disease. Um, and it, they can result in tooth loss. Um, initially, the, the cavity is going to be painless, <laughs> but as they continue to develop, toothaches usually occur, and you know that doesn't feel so good. Um, it often gets worse when you consume sweet, hot, or cold foods or drinks. Um, it can result in fractured teeth because they weaken the teeth structure. Um, whew, and then an ability to bite down on a tooth without pain is also a sign. Um, gum disease or periodontal disease, um, this is going to be different. This is generally going to include swollen and or bleeding gums. Gums that are tender to the touch and appear shiny or gums that appear bright red or red purple in color. Um, 
And let me tell you, early signs of this aren't going to be very obvious if you just like go to the mirror and open your mouth. But if you go to the mirror and open your mouth and shine a flashlight in, you can see a lot more detail. Try that. You'll see if you've got bright red areas around your gums. If you do, <clears throat> you might want to take a look at that. Um, when periodontal disease advances, it's not good. It results in loose teeth, foul breath. Um, you're going to end up with um, receding gum lines. Um, you will have crater-like ulcers between the teeth. Um, extensive gum bleeding, foul taste in the mouth, and you can even have a grayish biofilm that eventually appears on the gums. Um, <clears throat> all right. So how does this happen? Dental caries will usually begin when bacteria, specifically Streptococcus mutans. This is the one that I mentioned earlier that really likes to bind to teeth. Um, it produces a certain um, sticky sugar called dextran. And the dextran is an adhesion factor. So, well, it produces dextran and other adhesion factors and pili. So... It, these all together really allow biofilm formation to happen on the tooth, okay? And then other bacteria can then join the biofilm. So S. mutans starts the biofilm. He's the jerkwad that starts it all, or one of the big ones that they know of anyway. Um, yeah, and then you can end up with more than five to 700 bacterial species in this uh, biofilm. Uh, and it can contain nearly 10 bacteria, uh, 10 million, or billion, excuse me, 10 billion bacteria total. Um, now, once the biofilm forms, you get stress mutans along with lactobacillus and other species, like I said, up to 700 different species. They all together hang out in that biofilm. And every time you eat sugars and starches, those sugars and starches will enter the biofilm and these bacteria then ferment them. They break them down for food. It's what they do um, and their waste product is an acid. And that acid then slowly dissolves your tooth enamel. Um, and then that will allow the bacteria to get deeper into the tooth. There's dentin and then pulp layers of the tooth and they can get in there. And then the bacteria can destroy the dentin and pulp and eventually reach the nerves and blood vessels of the tooth and destroy those and they can cause loss of a tooth. Um, gingivitis is a little bit different. This is caused by pyro, excuse me, porphyromonas. Porphyromonas gingivalis. This is the common um, genus and species of bacteria that causes the periodontal disease. Um, and it is going to result only after you get the biofilms laid down by strep mutans. So strep mutans really does play a role in colonization by, by porphyromonas gingivalis. Because what happens is you get this biofilm that builds up around the base of the tooth and between the tooth and the gum. And that biofilm really kind of um, will harden and, and form tartar when you get calcium salts and other minerals that enter into the, the, the biofilm. And what then happens is you get irritation from that biofilm being present between the tooth and the gum. And that irritation and inflammation causes swelling of the gums. And that swelling, along with the plaque and tartar, causes this increased pressure because there's you know, there's really no room for the added tartar and plaque and swelling. And so you get these pockets, these tightly, you know, formed pockets that can be oxygen free um, down in the gum area where the gum is like swollen up and around the tartar. All right. You get these pockets and that is where poor Phyromonas comes into play. He is an anaerobe. This guy hates oxygen. And so you really need this pocket to form from this excessive amount of plaque and tartar and inflammation. And then poor Phyromonas enters the pocket and grows and, you know, reproduces and thrives and survives. 
um, it lives in that pocket. Um, and then what happens as this guy thrives and survives, he actually produces, we know of five different proteins that we're calling proteases. They break down proteins, five different enzymes that break down the gum tissue. Um, and it just destroys the gums. And bacteria can then, if they can reach the, the, the jaw bones, the, the bones underlying the gum tissue, they can actually invade the bone and cause osteomyelitis. You can end up with teeth becoming loose and falling out. All right, so what does this look like? Most of you probably know, um, most uh, adults have experienced some form of dental carry. Um, and they know that diets high in sucrose, that is table sugar, <laughs> increase the risk of decay. Um, about 6% of personal health expenditure in the U.S. is for dental services. And of Americans over age 65, 99.5% have experienced dental caries, with 78% of children having at least one cavity by the age of 17. Um, we know also that continual snacking and continual sipping on sugary drinks is problematic. Um, it leads to continual microbial activity because we're constantly feeding the bacteria the, the sugar and then they constantly break it down to acids and then you have constant destruction of tooth content or tooth enamel. Um, we also know that injury or trauma to the gums, misaligned teeth, rudge, excuse me, rough edges to fillings, ill-fitting dental appliances like dentures um, and cavities will contribute to gingivitis. Um, additional factors that contribute to gingivitis include pregnancy, uncontrolled diabetes because they're going to have high sugar content circulating in the body, um, general poor health and diet, um, use of birth control pills, which I thought was interesting, and also lead poisoning. Um, gingivitis will occur frequently in many people and to varying degrees over the course of their lifetime. Usually appears during puberty and early adulthood and if not treated it leads to periodontal disease which then does occur in about 70 percent of the US population as they age and up to 20 percent will experience bone loss so it's it's pretty severe and something to be um, thinking of. In addition to this um, before I tell you and show you the process um, and show you pictures. I want to remind you that we talked about oral health being very important for heart health, right? Remember, we know that bacteria in the mouth um, it can specifically enter the bloodstream um, through cavities or gingivitis or even oral procedures and can enter into the bloodstream, colonize the valves, for example, of the heart. A number of people um, have had serious heart damage due to oral bacteria severe enough where heart valves have to be replaced, etc. Um, all right, so this is showing you how Streptococcus mutans would kind of, and a cavity formation would, would proceed. So what you see first is Streptococcus mutans is going to be producing the dextran, it's going, which is the sticky sugar. It's a sticky polysaccharide that helps the, it's, it's the biofilm matrix. It's the sticky, snotty substance that attaches to the tooth and helps the bacteria attach. In addition to that, there's going to be pili that will bind to receptors. There's going to be other fimbri and other things we mentioned, and the biofilm forms. Other bacteria will then join the biofilm. You can have up to 700 different species in there. The strep mutans, the lactobacillus, and the others in that biofilm will then ferment sugar to acid. Every time you ingest sugar, some of it, yeah, fuels your metabolism, but some of it's also metabolized by the bacteria. And they make acids, and the acids slowly eat away the enamel. The enamel's the white layer here. Dentin is pink, and pulp is down there the blood vessels and nerve. You can see that the acids can erode through the enamel into the dentin, into the pulp if left untreated, and it can result in lots of pain and tooth loss. <clears throat> I don't have an image 
a cartoon image anyway, of um, gum disease, but I do have sort of an image showing you what healthy gums look like. They're gonna be light pink. You're not gonna see swelling. They're not gonna be receded. You don't see any evidence of tooth erosion. Early signs of gingivitis, what I'm seeing here, increased redness. I see swelling along the gum line there. It's swollen there. Look at that. That's a big swollen spot. Look at that compared to that. That's swollen. Very red compared to the others. You see that the gum line is also receded back further than it should be. As it progresses, you start noticing we're seeing areas of the tooth that should not be exposed. <laughs> all around these. The, the gum has further receded, it's increased its redness, and this just continues and continues. All right, what about bacterial diseases of the stomach? Are there any? I said that the stomach is pretty acidic, but yes, there are bacterial diseases of the stomach as well, and peptic ulcers is an example of that. Interesting about peptic ulcers is that we did not know it was caused by bacteria um, until just a few years ago. Um, peptic ulcers, what are they? They are erosions of the linings of the stomach or of the upper small intestine. That's a peptic ulcer. It could become a perforation if the peptic ulcer pierces the stomach lining or the intestinal lining and goes, the ulcer goes so deep that there's a hole now, that's a perforation, all right? At one time, like I said, physicians considered peptic ulcers and perforation, perforations to be the result of drinking too much alcohol, <laughs> um, smoking, eating the wrong foods, stress, or worry. All right, we now know that, yes, those things can contribute to peptic ulcers because, yeah, they do, the, drinking alcohol, smoking, um, wrong foods, stress, all of that will definitely contribute to irritation of the stomach lining and can contribute to an ulcer. But the actual ulcer itself, we now know, is a bacterial infection. Um, abdominal pain um, blood in the feces can also be a sign, um, but abdominal pain is the main symptom. Um, if you have a perforation, there's going to be a lot more. You should probably notice more blood in the feces, um, and if it's not treated, there's going to be there can end up being major blood loss if it reaches a vessel or vein, and and you have internal bleeding. Um, so much internal bleeding that you can have shock because the blood pressure would drop significantly. Um, I actually lost an aunt due to an ulcer that perforated the lining of her stomach and she hemorrhaged and died within minutes. It was, it was crazy. Um, anyway, it's caused by Helicobacter pylori. This is a gram negative bacteria. It's a modal bacterium and its flagella are very, very, very important. Um, the flagella actually enable the bacteria, it has a number of virulence factors, and flagella is one of them. It has to use its flagella to burrow down through the mucus, because your stomach is a mucous membrane. Your stomach lining produces, the cells produce a thick layer of mucus, and this mucus generally protects them from the acid um, contents of the stomach. So the bacteria also, the helicobacter, it survives the stomach by burrowing down into the mucus and basically that protects it from the acids. It also has these adhesins that will, once it burrows down through the mucus layer, it can attach to the stomach cells. It has enzymes that will inhibit phagocytosis and prevent it from being destroyed. And it has another enzyme called urease that actually, this is an extracellular enzyme that neutralizes stomach acid, the urease it catalyzes a reaction that turns the stomach acid into urea, which raises the pH. <laughs> so it basically hides from the stomach acid, destroys the stomach acid, attaches to the gastric cells, and inhibits itself from being destroyed. Um, let me show you. 
And then all of this results in some changes that we think either causes or contributes to the ulcer. Let me show you. Here's an image showing sort of an illustration of this procedure. Um, here's Helicobacter pylori. It's in the stomach. Someone has ingested this. We suspect the fecal oral route as transmission, right? So someone has ingested feces that contain Helicobacter pylori. It's lovely thought, I know. Um, once in the stomach, the Helicobacter pylori will use its flagella to drive down through the layer of mucus to reach the stomach cells. So these are mucus secreting cells. <clears throat> and Helicobacter is driving down um, and attaching to, you see it now, attaching to those cells. And it's going to start producing toxins. It's going to, they're also showing the area around the Helicobacter <coughs> Excuse me. Around the Helicobacter as being like this light color, and the area away from it as being this green color. The green color is the acid, and the area around it, because this bacteria is producing urease, there's not so much acid. The urease enzyme is breaking down the acid and causing it to form urea and raising the pH around the bacteria. So they're in like this protected environment. As they navigate through the acid. And then they reach the, the mucus and they use their flagella to drive through and they attach. All right. Now, a combination of that. We aren't really sure. We think it's a variety of factors. We think that the bacteria attaching to the cells will trigger inflammation. Um... Uh, in addition to the toxins produced, we think that maybe it's destroying the mucus producing cells. So we think maybe death of the mucus producing cells and or inflammation or both of them causes thinning of the mucus. You notice the area, so it's really thick here, but once they attach, they're showing now that the mucus in this area is thin. The mucus over here is still thick because there's not bacteria there. But the mucus here is thinning in this region due to the toxins, due to death of these cells, and due to inflammation. We think it's a combination of all that. The mucus thins, and this allows as the acids, the gastric juices now, to reach the epithelial cells and further destroy the cells. So the toxins produced by the bacteria, as well as the acids now, because the mucus thinned, the acids reach them, it destroys the cells that line the stomach, and then the acid reaches deeper tissues, and so do the bacteria. They can reach deeper and deeper tissues. If this gets further and further and further and reaches a blood vessel or vein, that's when you have a perforation and bleeding. All right, like I said, this is really, really interesting. We do know, we do think, excuse me, that fecal oral transmission is likely um, because of the fact that it is a stomach or GI type, you know, infection. Um, but this, this is really interesting because a number of people are colonized with Helicobacter pylori and they don't all have ulcers. So we aren't really sure why some people have the bacterium but no ulcers. And then the thing is, though, that we find everyone with ulcers has it. Okay? So, in addition, we have shown that Helicobacter pylori in human or cat feces on the hands, in well water, or on fomites can infect humans and cause ulcers. There are risk factors that increase this. Use of aspirin, ibuprofen, other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications because those irritate the lining of the stomach. Excessive alcohol consumption, like I said, smoking cigarettes or other tobacco products, even a family history of ulcers. Emotional stress does not cause ulcers but can also worsen them and make treatment more difficult. So all of this stuff kind of contributes. <clears throat> 
they will diagnose you based on helicobacter pylori presence in clinical step specimens. And if they find that, they're going to give you antibiotics. All right. Which of the following is a virulence factor important to helicobacter pylori during form formation of ulcers? What's your answer? Think about it. All right, flagella. Good. I could have also said urease. Um, I think urease or flagella would be the examples I would probably give in this question if I was to change it. Type 3 secretion system, that belongs to E. coli or salmonella, didn't it? Yep. <clears throat> All right, urease helps in the production of ulcers by Helicobacter pylori by... What's your answer? Think about it. All right. Yes. Urease does not increase acid production. That would not protect Helicobacter pylori. It neutralizes acids produced by cells lining the stomach, allowing the bacteria to survive the acids. All right. An interesting YouTube video if you want to watch it. I'm not going to show it right now. Um, but this, this guy, Dr. Barry Marshall, actually was, he won the Nobel Prize. He was crucial in showing that Helicobacter pylori caused ulcers. He actually drank Helicobacter pylori at a conference in front of many other scientists and then documented formation of his ulcers. It's really cool. Anyway, take a look if you're interested. All right. Another one that I think, this one fascinates me, and I'm really excited to tell you about it. <laughs> this is another type of bacterial gastroenteritis. Um, this is a severe form. Severe. This is called antimicrobial-associated diarrhea, or you might have heard it commonly called C. diff. People call it C. diff because it is caused by bacterium Clostridium difficile. Um... Clostridium difficile is in the intestines of about 5% of us. Um, so it's not in the intestines of that many of us, but about 5% of us are carriers of this bacteria. Um, and it usually causes us no known issues because you've got lots of other bacteria in there. And the other bacteria keep the C. diff at low, low numbers in people that carry it. And then like 95% of us don't have C. diff at all. So either you have it at a very, very low number or you don't have it at all, okay? You could get it, though, if someone was infected with it, especially this is happening in hospitals more so than in the general population. But I have friends that have had C. diff infections, so, and they were not hospitalized. So I know this is becoming more and more prevalent. Um, so what it is, it's a severe form of diarrhea. Um, it is accompanied by intense inflammation and formation of lesions, in the colon. Um, the lesions, we call it pseudomembranous colitis. You get these pseudomembranes that form in the colon. Um, and I'll show you an image of that. Um, why this is coming more and more and more um, prevalent is because this is really um, a product of like technology, I should say. Um, it's a product of modern medicine with the widespread use of antimicrobial drugs. It's becoming more and more prevalent. Okay, there are about 500,000 cases annually in the U.S. and there's about 15,000 deaths per year. Um, and people that are infected would shed C. diff in their feces, which can then infect other people. Okay. And they say about 20% of hospital patients carry C. diff after they have left the hospital. Wow. So how do you get this? It is through use. Like I said, it was a product of technology. So this was not, a, this was very rare in the past. It is more and more prevalent now as we are using more and more antimicrobials. So when you take antibiotics 
a risk of antibiotics, especially if you use some of the more um, newer, like stronger antibiotics, or if you are using antibiotics in combination or for a prolonged amount of time. Um, it makes it more, more you know, likely that you would get this. Also, if you're older, burn patient, immunocompromised, if you've had a previous case of C. diff, if you have kidney failure, or if you're recovering from abdominal surgery, they say you're particularly susceptible to this. But what happens is if you use antibiotics, C. diff then overgrows because the antibiotics kill every other bacteria. C. diff is resistant to most antibiotics. It takes a very special antibiotic to kill this guy. All right, and so most antibiotics that you might be taking due to another infection will not affect C. diff, but they might kill off all your other normal flora in your, back, in your intestines. And so if those antibiotics kill the normal flora in your intestines and you get contaminated with or you happen to be a carrier of this guy, this guy will now colonize and overgrow and cause disease. This guy produces two toxins. Um, this guy is actually an endospore producer as well. So that makes this really, really hard once you get it because this guy now grows in the intestines. He's producing endospores. <laughs> we know antibiotics don't kill endospores, right? Um, all right. This guy produces toxins, a toxin A and a toxin B. Let's see. Um, toxin A is a cytotoxin which kills cells outright. Toxin A is a cytotoxin and an enterotoxin, I should say. All right, so it actually breaks down the junctions holding cells of the colon together and causes diarrhea. So it's killing the cells and breaking the junctions and causing diarrhea. And then toxin B is a cytotoxin that kills the, the colon cells again, like if they weren't already dead. Um, and together, toxin A and B cause this severe diarrhea and death of the intestinal cells. Um, they, and it's, it's really interesting because the dead cells will actually, it's, it's a weird way that they die. When they die, they actually fuse and they form these characteristic like pussy looking spots um, that we call the pseudomembrane. Um, let me show you. Here it is. So these are the fused regions of dead cells in the colon. These cells are all dead and fused together oh, and very, very painful. This, this is one inflamed, irritated colon. All right. Now, I didn't really say what signs and symptoms were. <laughs> I should elucidate that. Um, signs and symptoms are pretty interesting. So you're gonna have around 10 watery, foul-smelling bowel movements per day. Um, and if it progresses, it will involve inflammation that results in at least 10 bloody stools per day. So it's going to be watery, foul-smelling as well as bloody. Um, and, and you're gonna have very severe cramping and abdominal pain, fever, malaise, aches, chills, pain, all of that. All right, um, like I said, it was a byproduct of modern medicine and any microbial you know, antibiotic contribute to the disease. But like I said, the, the newer, more powerful ones or using more than one drug at the same time, um, treating two different conditions at the same time, or if you've got like immunocompromised, or if you're hospitalized. Um, diagnosis, they're going to look for the bacteria um, and the toxins. Um, they can also generally look in the colon with a scope and see the, the pseudomembranous colitis. Um, and so what are they going to do if you have this? It's interesting because it's caused by antimicrobials. They're going to treat you generally with antimicrobials, um, <laughs> which seems counterintuitive. 
Um, and then you're going to avoid unnecessary use of antimicrobials, except the ones that they're trying to treat you with. Um, problem with this is that using antibiotics does not um, always work. Um, these bacteria will produce endospores, and the, the endospores are not destroyed by the antibiotics. And so the failure rate of this is pretty high, and people will have relapses. Um, so a new thing that's coming along <laughs> that I think is so interesting is this idea of um, a fecal transplant as the way to cure C. diff. Because in a person that has C. diff, um, what's going on, right, is that the bacteria have all been killed. The, the healthy, normal flora have been destroyed by antibiotics. And so the idea is that if we can replace the normal bacteria then we can prevent overgrowth of C. diff and, and cure the C. diff. And so what the idea is, is to go into a healthy person, someone that has a healthy normal flora, and remove fecal material, extract the feces, prepare it in some way. They generally blend the stool with saline solution, put it through a strainer, <laughs> um, and then give it to the person with C. diff through a tube, through the nose, I know, gross, or an enema up the butt, right? Um, in the future, that's how it's currently being done. It, it's working pretty well, these two ways. Um, I don't think it's widely available in the U.S., but it is in other countries, um, and it, it works better than antibiotics from what research I've read. Um, it does have a gross factor to it, um, and in the future, I think it'll be a lot better. They are hoping to replace transplants with, um, you know, odorless <laughs> mix of bacterial strains derived from human stool that's grown in the lab and, and put into a pill form. Um, it could be applied using existing methods, maybe the enema. It'd be more attractive, right, than knowing that you're getting a stool from some sort of donor. Anyway. All right, what about viruses? Can you get viruses of the GI tract and have viral gastroenteritis? Well, yeah, you can. I've told you about that in the beginning. So let's look at a couple of those. Not, not too many. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. There's a number of viruses, though, that can cause diseases of the digestive system that will have signs and symptoms pretty similar to bacterial gastroenteritis. Um, but... Viral gastroenteritis is generally and usually less severe than the bacterial forms. And it's often more self-limiting and you just need to let it run its course kind of thing um, versus needing antibiotics, right, if it's bacterial. Um, one thing I want to mention is viral, gastro, viral gastroenteritis is not a stomach flu. People will call it the stomach flu, but that is a misnomer, all right? The flu is reserved for influenza viruses. So it should be an influenza virus causing a respiratory illness. There's no stomach flu, so to speak. Um, but if you insist on calling it that, uh, okay, don't do it on the exam. Anyway, <laughs> you can say it's a stomach virus. I'm okay with that. Um, it's just not a stomach flu because flu is respiratory and it's caused by influenza. Anyway, okay. Um, usually, um, stomach viruses, if you will, is going to be caused by, there's a number of viruses, um, calciviruses, these are commonly called noroviruses. These you might have heard of as far as outbreaks on the, the cruise ships. Cruise ships recently have been famous for these norovirus outbreaks. Um, there's also these a family of viruses called astroviruses, and there's a family called rotaviruses. Um, and then within each of these, of course, there's going to be multiple types. All of these will infect the epithelial cells lining the GI tract. And as the epithelial cells die from the infection, because there are going to be virus factories now and they're going to lice and release viruses, um, you, they're, you're going to lose function of the GI tract, basically, is what's going to happen. And that results in the, the signs and symptoms. You're going to have fever, chills, clammy skin, weight loss, lack of you know, appetite, um, fluid loss, uh, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. Um, dehydration is going to be the most common complication. Um, and you're usually going to have 
you know, these signs and symptoms occur within 24 hours of being contaminated with the virus. And it usually will resolve within 12 to 60 hours. Um, you don't usually have bloody stool, life-threatening diarrhea with viral gastroenteritis, okay? Not common. Um, epidemiology of this, this can be fecal oral transplant, or excuse me, fecal oral transplant, the fecal oral route of contamination, um, or if you come into contact with the vomitus <laughs> or the diarrhea. So any of the excreted fluids. Um, and it gets into your mouth. A lot of times, um, if you are in the vicinity of someone throwing up, um, a lot of these noroviruses especially are known for causing this projectile, forceful type vomit, which can cause aerosolization in vomit particles. <laughs> yeah, liquid particles, droplet transmission can occur. Some of them, if you're nearby. Um, yeah, okay, so, Cases of viral gastroenteritis are going to be more common and more frequent in the winter. Um, transmission is facilitated by close living conditions um, and people being indoors. 90% of this viral gastroenteritis is caused by noroviruses. Um, and they have been known, like I said, on cruise ships, but also in daycares, schools, hospitals, nursing homes, restaurants. Um, rotaviruses are more known for infantile gastroenteritis. They account for about 50% of the diarrhea cases in children. That requires hospitalization because of fluid and electrolyte loss. So they're more, they can be more severe in children. Um, there's about 100,000 hospitalizations and 100 deaths per year in the U.S. from these rotaviruses. Um, but in developing countries, they might kill about 600,000 children. Uh, a year and account for about 5% of all childhood deaths. So this is definitely more problematic in developing countries like all diseases are, all infectious diseases. Um, stool samples would be analyzed, but there's really no specific treatment for any of these infections except support and replacement of loss of fluids and electrolytes. Um, Anti-diarrheal medications, like with the bacterial forms of gastroenteritis, that may prolong symptoms because you know, you're going to be keeping and holding the viruses in your system for longer. Diarrhea tends to clear the viruses out. There is a vaccine for rotaviruses, um, but not the others. All right, so here's some images. Um, just for interest, right, noroviruses are up top. They have star-shaped capsids, so they're kind of cute. And then the wheel-like appearance of the rotaviruses are down here. <clears throat> um, deaths from rotaviral diseases are most common in developing countries. Like I said, they kill about 600,000 children worldwide in developing regions and um, account for about 5% of childhood deaths. All right. Now, those are, I believe, the remaining... That's all for the remaining diseases, the new diseases I wanted to tell you about um, with this section. However, I wanted to remind you, like I did with typhoid Mary and typhoid, I, I wanted to remind you that we talked about that previously. So I want to remind you of a protozoan disease. So this is a protozoan gastroenteritis. And it's Giardia. Remember we talked about Giardia caused by this protist, Giardia intestinalis. We talked about the frothy, greasy, foul-smelling diarrhea. We talked about fresh water. We talked about severe gas. It smelled like rotten eggs, so it had some very characteristic signs and symptoms. Here's the little guys, and they had these little these um, discs that it uh, actually facilitate attachment. You can see damage done to the intestinal lining from the attachment of these parasites. Um, remember we said it's from drinking cysts and contaminated water and hikers and campers are a particular risk, but I did say your dog could also get this. You need to either, you know, filter water 
treat it with iodine or boil it to prevent it. Um, if you do get Giardia, there are treatments, <clears throat> but um, so there's antibiotics, well, antimicrobials, I should say. It's not an antibiotic. There's also amoebiasis. Remember, you can get an amoebic infection. This is another protozoan disease. We talked about this back when we talked about protists in the very beginning section. Um, we talked about entamoeba histolytical histolytica causing um, uh, some diarrhea, amoebic dysentery. I also talked then about the, you know, that brain-eating amoeba. The brain-eating amoeba does not cause, you know, protozoan gastroenteritis. That's going to cause protozoan meningitis and encephalitis. Um, <clears throat> but entamoeba histolytica did cause amoebic dysentery, which is gastroenteritis. So I want to remind you of that. Um, and again, this is from contaminated consumption of contaminated food or water, fecal oral route, um, and treatment of symptoms is probably the, there's not a, um, a medicine, I don't think. Actually, yes, there is. There's anti-amoebic drugs for that. I won't re-quiz you over Giardia, okay? And I won't re-quiz you on the exam over amoebiasis. I also won't re-quiz you over helmets, okay? But I do want you to remember that you can have worm infestations of the GI tract. Um, and you remember, we talked about tapeworms and tapeworm infestation. There's the life cycle. So I won't reread this. Um, and that's it. Um, so there should be one more PowerPoint that you all look for. It will be coming on um, 428, and it will be on the future and possibility of zombie apocalypse. Let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you all on Zoom or email.